Okay, um, so the last session for this morning uh, is actually a team talk given by a group that is working on the cortical activity map project here at the Allen Institute. Um, as was mentioned earlier this morning, this is the team of people that's actually putting together a fairly substantial pipeline operation for doing a systematic approach to recording from optical physiological areas of the visual cortex that we've designed to be responsive to visual stimuli. So uh, let's all welcome the entire group of people that's going to be presenting. We have Marina Garrett, we have Derek Williams, Ellie Kreedberg, we have Sissy, who's I think in the right order. Yes, we have Sissy Cross, uh, Fu Wei, and we have Sheila Caldohan. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Marina Garrett, and I am a scientist in the Neural Coding Group. And I'm very proud to introduce our final team talk titled Navigating the Cortical Activity Map. The MindScope project is arranged around a set of nine important questions in neuroscience that can be organized along the axes of components, computation, and cognition. Today's talk features a pipeline project aimed at understanding sensory representations. Specifically, we ask how are stimulus, behavior, and state uh, represented by neural activity in the mouse cortex in both single cells and neural populations. This project is called the cortical activity map. The cortical activity map, or CAM for short, is a neurophysiological survey across areas, layers, and predefined cell types to measure activity in response to a broad array of visual stimuli chosen to map the spatiotemporal receptive field and responses to natural images and movies in the same population of cells, something that's never been done before. In addition, future data releases will include activity during visually guided behavior so that sensory and behavioral responses can be directly compared. Today, we're going to give you an overview of the ingredients required to produce the final CAM data product. As we go through each step of the pipeline, you will be guided by some of the people on the front lines who are actively involved in data collection, platform development, and analysis. For the first step in the experimental workflow, you'll hear from Ali, who will describe the surgical procedures to create a window into the brain and facilitate registration across all platforms of the pipeline. Next, Sheila will describe, I'm sorry, yes, excuse me. Next, Sheila will describe the use of intrinsic signal imaging to identify distinct visual areas and target where in the brain we want to image. Sissy will go through the behavioral training procedures that are essential to working with awake behaving animals as well as the use of in vivo two-photon calcium imaging, also called optical physiology, or OFIS, to measure the activity of populations of neurons in response to visual stimuli. The final step of the experimental workflow, which won't be discussed today, uh, is the use of multi-photon serial section imaging using the tissue site system, which produces anatomical images of the entire mouse brain that we can use to register the CAM data set into the common coordinate framework and link to other products, uh, data products generated by the institute. None of this would be possible without the work of the engineering team, whose uh, work feeds into every stage of the pipeline. Derek will tell you about uh, several of their contributions in developing software and hardware tools to facilitate this complex workflow. Finally, the output of all this work is, product, is uh, processed and packaged by the technology team to produce the final CAM data product that will be shared with the neuroscience community. You will hear several examples of this work from Fu Wei of the technology team. So needless to say, this project is the work of dozens of individuals in addition to those you'll hear from today, uh, integrating expertise from multiple teams in a truly collaborative effort. So now, with that. Without further ado, Ali will discuss the first stage of the pipeline. Hi, I'm Ali, as Marina said, and I am on the surgery team. So in order to accomplish the goals of CAM and measure activity in specific visual areas shown in the image on the left, we first need to be able to access the brain and repeatedly find and return to the cells we want to image from day to day. The target neurons shown in the image on the right uh, are about 12 microns in size, quite small. And as you can imagine, finding and returning to these cells is a big challenge of the pipeline. Uh, in order for the imaging teams to identify the target regions in the visual cortex, the surgery team first needs to create a window into the brain shown in the middle image by replacing a small piece of skull with a clear glass cover slip. 
This allows access to a five millimeter diameter region of the visual cortex. The experimental setup of the CAM pipeline involves collecting data on multiple systems, including intrinsic signal imaging, behavior training, and optical physiology. And each of these experiments involves presenting a visual stimulus to the animal on a monitor in a fixed location. And in order to compare the visual responses of these animals, it's essential to maintain a consistent relationship between the eye position and the visual stimulus on the monitor. To achieve consistent placement of the mouse across all systems and address the issue of finding and returning to the same cells day after day, the engineering team designed a custom head frame that is affixed to the mouse's skull in a standardized location. The head frame consists of a plastic head plate or well and a stainless steel clamp plate that allows reproducible placement of the animal across all systems in the pipeline. The uh, clamp plate fits perfectly into the placement tool, which in turn is secured to the stereotaxic arm of the surgical setup. Um, and before attaching the head frame to the skull, the surgeons use a leveling protocol that is anatomically referenced so that the head frame is consistently placed over the visual cortex. So uh, the cranial window is then made within the well to expose the part of the brain that we want to image. Uh, the 3D image on the left illustrates the final optimal position of the head frame and ensures that we have most or all visual areas uh, accessible within the window. A standardized clamping system was made to match the head frame clamp plate and ensure that we have consistent head and eye position on all platforms of the pipeline. And this concept is known as cross-platform registration, a term you'll hear again in this talk. And it's essential for keeping all of the data in a common reference framework for downstream analysis. Uh, after the head frame is secu secured, uh, the craniotomy is made. We drill a small piece of skull away and replace it with a clear glass cover slip. This cover slip creates a flat surface for imaging through all cortical layers. The surgeons work to produce a clear and healthy brain for imaging, so during the procedure we try to reduce brain swelling, prevent any kind of cortical damage, and all the while keep the brain hydrated and cool. The final step of the surgery is to take an image on the surgical photo documentation system that was designed by our engineering team with all of the same imaging angles as the other experimental setups in the pipeline. This image is then uploaded to LIMS, our laboratory information management system, where it can be used uh, by everyone to monitor brain health throughout the pipeline. The uh, animal then spends about two weeks recovering from surgery before being handed off to the imaging team for ISI, which Sheila will tell you about now. Hi everyone, my name is Sheila and I'm a member of the imaging team with Instructured Science. So in order for us to target specific areas of interest in the cortex and be able to reliably return to the same region, we need to create maps to navigate within the cranial window. Intrinsic signal imaging, or ISI, allows us to generate several maps that display functionally defined cortical areas within the mouse visual cortex. So we receive a mouse that has been outfitted with a cranial window. The mouse is lightly anesthetized and is then loaded into a custom designed ISI system. The system is registered such that the placement and coordinates of the cranial window can be translated to other experimental platforms of the CAM pipeline. So first, a green LED illuminates the cranial window. This allows us to generate an image of the brain's surface vasculature, which we use to monitor the brain's health at this stage of the pipeline, and is also later used for aligning additional data, additional data sets that will be later generated. Next, a red LED is used to capture the intrinsic signal, which measures the changes in hemodynamic response associated with brain activity. So non-activated regions of the cortex have a baseline oxygen consumption, which reflects red light. In comparison, activated regions of the cortex show increased oxygen consumption and blood flow, which absorbs the red light. So we present a drifting bar stimulus to the mass to activate regions of the cortex. The stimulus is warped to maintain the constant size and speed of the drifting bar and to display spherical coordinates on a flat screen. The stimulus is played in both directions 
north to south, south to north, east to west, and west to east to subtract out the hemodynamic delay and to distinguish neighboring areas which naturally have opposite field signs. The stimulus allows consistent portions of the visual field to be stimulated and helps determine the extent of the receptive field. The horizontal motion of the drifting bar stimulates the constant lines of altitude, and we represent the spherical coordinates by oh, we represent the spherical coordinates by colors. Uh, the vertical motion of the drifting bar stimulates the constant lines of azimuth. So during an experiment, the red LED illuminates the mass's cranial window. The system's components are seen to capture the intrinsic signal as the mass is being shown the stimulus. This is repeated over the course of several trials to produce an average altitude and azimuth retinotopy, as well as an average field sign map. This sign map is a product of the orthogonal gradients of the, and, of the altitude and azimuth and shows the defined area boundaries of V1 and other higher visual areas. These generated data sets are then uploaded to our limb system where they are automatically annotated using an algorithm that Fu Wei will later explain. In LIMS, the segmentation editor feature allows us to manually curate and correct the segmented area boundaries. The generated sign map with designated area boundaries and retinotopic location are necessary for accurate area targeting and will allow dance stream cam processes to be able to map through the visual cortex. So next, Sissy will tell you about the behavior aspect and one of the two, Im two photon imaging platforms of CAM. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Sissy, and I'm in the neurosurgery and behavior team and the imaging team. So I'm going to discuss the next two stages of the CAM pipeline. Um, behavior training and optical physiology are the only two steps of the pipeline that involve an awake behaving animal. So animals spend time in the behavior training facility um, getting trained and then are handed off to the imaging team where we record the activity of neurons in response to visual stimulus. Yes, we're using this. Okay, so all behavior training um, begins with a habituation procedure. So animals are gradually introduced to being head fixed as well as to the running disc. Um, once the animals complete a week of habituation, they transfer um, to one of two different tracks. And so the first track that they can take, they get additional exposure, this time to a visual stimulus. Um, so they are accustomed to the presentation of stimuli before going on to a two photon imaging session. The second track that they can take, um, the animals stay in the behavior training facility and are trained on a visual detection task. Um, the goal is to train the animal to um, report when it detects a target visual stimulus by um, licking to which it receives a reward. And so once the animals are trained on this task, they then go to uh, 2P imaging, this time um, while performing a visually guided uh, behavior task under the 2P scope. Here is an overview of the behavior training facility. So the image on the left is a cluster of rigs. So each rig consists of six boxes. Um, we can train and habituate about 35 animals a day. Um, we're going to add another cluster um, in 2016 so we can double our capacity of training and habituating animals in the behavior facility. So inside each one of those boxes is a custom behavior stage. Um, the animal is head fixed in the same position um, that it will be in across the platform. So it's, um, when it's clamped in with the head frame, it's in the same position as it is in the ISI and the OFIS stage. And the image on the right um, is just some monitoring systems that we have. Um, so the left monitor allows us to um, monitor the animal's performance um, while performing the task. The center monitors allow us to monitor the animal's health and interact with behavioral scripts. And the webcam viewer um, allows us to observe the animal, all the animals throughout the behavior training uh, session. So um, once the animals have completed habituation and training, they, uh, they transition to optical physiology, which I might call uh, two photon imaging or OFIS and other slides, but I'm talking about optical physiology. Um, this is where we're able to record the activity of uh, neurons and awake animals by bringing together all of the components we've talked about today. So the cranial window surgery allows us access to the brain to target cells, and the ISI maps allow us to reliably navigate to these visual areas. And the behavior training and habituation allow us to record activity in animals that have been accustomed to uh, 
being presented stimuli and um, being head fixed. So in the CAM pipeline, we're targeting multiple visual areas and cortical layers as well as um, different transgenic lines. So as Sheila mentioned, the retinotopic maps generated by ISI allow us to identify the boundaries and visual areas, as well as specific retinotopic locations within each region. Um, this allows us to image from neurons that represent the same part of visual space, um, so we can accurately compare responses across different populations of cells. So once we identify the area we want to image, we can navigate precisely to that location under the two-photon microscope and zoom in on a population of neurons at a defined cortical depth. Um, so once we've navigated to our target region, we record movies of uh, cellular activity in response to visual stimuli. The um, mice express a genetically encoded calcium indicator um, in a defined population of cells, so it increases in fluorescence when they're active as shown in the movie. The technology team then takes these raw movies and um, perform motion correction and uh, image segmentation to um, identify a set of pixels that belong to each cell. And so those segmentation masks then get used to extract traces for each cell um, so that we can examine their activity across time. And the goal is to um, relate the activity of each cell back to the visual stimulus that was presented um, to the mouse. And this is an image that keeps popping up, but it, it just is displaying the variety of stimulus sets that um, are included in the CAM uh, stimulus set. Um, including static and drifting gratings and locally sparse noise to, uh, to map the spatial and temporal response properties uh, to a population of image neurons, as well as um, natural images and movies so that we can compare the responses across different stimulus types. And lastly, here is a data set of activity in response to uh, drifting gratings. So the image on the right is uh, displaying all the cells are colored according to the direction that it prefers. And so as you can see, neighboring cells have a diverse direction preference. The figure on the left is uh, the activity of this individual cell in response to drifting gratings. And as you can see, it's highly selective to uh, 90 and 270 degrees and doesn't respond to anything uh, over 4 hertz. So similarly, the activity of each neuron in the final data product will be measured in response to the entire CAM stim daily CAM stimulus data set. Um, and next, I'll hand it over to Derek, and he'll talk about the tools engineering <coughs> I've created so far to help this support the CAM pipeline. How's it going? I'm uh, Derek Williams. I'm one of the two software engineers on the uh, manufacturing and process engineering team. Um, as uh, Marina said, uh, our team has pretty much had its grubby little mitts in almost every aspect of this pipeline, um, both hardware and software. Uh, but uh, I'm one of the software engineers, um, and I've only got a couple minutes, so I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the software problems we had to solve for this. Um, so one of the challenges uh, in creating a data collection pipeline is consistency. Uh, we need to be able to ensure that every day the data is collected the same way regardless of rig or operator or mouse or any of the other factors that could affect uh, or could change from day to day. So the way that we solve that is uh, what we call the workflow sequence engine. Um, <clears throat> the way it works is a scientist and an engineer. Uh, obviously, you can see he's the engineer because he's got his hard hat on. Uh, they get together and they create a workflow. And that workflow uh, is essentially all of the steps needed to create a perfect, complete uh, data collection session. Uh, that workflow is fed into our workflow sequence engine user interface, uh, which then guides the, uh, the rig operator through the data collection process uh, step by step. It also automates some procedures, like uh, it ensures that the two-photon rig uh, starts its uh, data collection on time, it ensures the stimulus starts at the right moment, it ensures that the uh, video monitoring and eye tracking software start at the right moment. Uh, it also, at the end of the day, uh, packages up the data and ships it off to LIMS uh, so that it can be organized with uh, the rest of the data. Um, another problem we uh, worked on is uh, video monitoring. When we 
first started doing software development for CAM, we knew we wanted to track the eyes so that we could estimate the gaze of the animal. Um, so we you know, made some software that could be uh, remote controlled by the workflow sequence engine and record eye movement. Uh, Eventually, we decided we also wanted to track the, uh, or record the body, um, just so that we could monitor the behavior of the animal during the experiment. Uh, so we had to make sort of the classic uh, software design choice of should we just add support for one additional camera or support for an arbitrary number of cameras. And uh, we foresaw a possible future where we might want to track uh, whisker position or licks. So we wound up creating a nice little software package that uh, allows remote control of an arbitrary number of cameras from the workflow. Uh, sequence engine. Uh, we also made some simple analysis tools like this eye tracking software. Uh, you can see the algorithm running on a video over on the right. Um, it, uh, it's uh, overlaid on top of the video is the uh, estimated pupil position and area as well as the uh, estimated position of the uh, corneal reflection of the infrared LED that we're using to illuminate the eye and provide a, a sort of a real world registration point. Um, so that's eye tracking. Um, okay, uh, another problem we uh, had to work on was temporal alignment. Um, in a two-photon experiment, there are lots of different data streams, and uh, oftentimes they're running in different processes and on different computers. And uh, to analyze the data, you need to be able to align all of your uh, your data streams together so that you know what happened when. Um, the way that we do this and the way that we solve this problem is we record all these events uh, with uh, a small piece of custom software and a high-speed digital I.O. board uh, that um, creates a data set of all of the events that occurred throughout the experiment. Um, this gets, at the end of the experiment, uh, losslessly compressed into a data set that just features the events and their time points. Um, that gets converted to HDF5 by the workflow sequence engine and then packaged up with the rest of the data at the end of the day and ferried over to our LIMS database, um, at which point the technology team takes over and Fu Hui is going to talk to you about some of that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Fu Hui Long from technology team. So in support of each part of the CAM project, our team is developing informatics tools uh, for data processing and final product delivery. And today I'm going to show you four examples. Now first let me start with the tools we develop in support of the intrinsic signal imaging. So in able to enable um, high throughput processing of the ISI data, we need an automated way to um, delineate the boundaries of the functional areas and assign identities to them. Therefore, we developed an automated annotation pipeline. And we use the 35 ISI experiment data as a training set to enable a computer program to gain the knowledge of the cortical areas. For each image sequence, we start from the sign map generated by the uh, engineering team. We use an automated approach to segment each individual cortical area and manually annotate their identities. And then we build an atlas uh, with 12 major cortical areas. On top of that, we also did statistical analysis of the location, uh, size, uh, shape, and spatial relationship, as well as a sign of those areas. And this set of information carried by the atlas is used to guide an automated annotation algorithm to assign identities to uh, the segmented regions in new ISI image sequence. Um, our experiment shows that we can achieve about 97% accuracy in uh, segmenting and annotating um, a pilot data. So in order to uh, allow manual curation of the errors produced by the automated algorithm, we also developed an interactive tool uh, to edit the, the results. <laughs> Next, I'm going to talk about the motion correction and cell analysis module we developed for optical physiology. So the upper left video shows the uh, raw data from a two-photon calcium imaging experiment. And you can see cell position shifts significantly from frame to frame. 
So in order to reduce the art artifactual fluorescence changes that could contaminate the downstream uh, neural activity analysis, we developed the motion correction algorithm based on phase correlation. And the upper right video shows you the motion corrected data, and you can see the major shifts has been greatly reduced. We also developed a cell segmentation algorithm to identify the individual cells with uh, the boundaries and location uh, extracted. With our trace analysis uh, algorithm, we are able to extract a trace of individual and populations of cells for further analysis and modeling. The third example I'm go going to show you today is how to map the CAM data to the uh, common coordinate framework. So in order to map in, uh, in the, each individual cells in the optical physiology experiments to the CCF, we develop a pipeline that involves three steps. The first step is to map the office field of view into the ISI field of view, and this is a 2D to 2D mapping. The second step is to warp the ISI field of view to the tissue site brain surface using the vasculature landmarks, and this is a 2D to 3D mapping. And the third step is to warp the 3D tissue site brain surface to the CCF using intensity-based uh, iterative regist registration, and this is a 3D to 3D mapping. So through this, these three steps, we were able to place each cell into the CCF. And finally, uh, I'd like to briefly mention uh, database and product sharing. So all the data, including visual stimuli and the raw data, such as the two-photon calcium imaging, the ISI, and eye-tracking image sequences, as well as the process data, such as the segmentation results, motion correction results, and the trace analysis results, are all packed and stored in NWB format and managed by our internal database called LIMPS. And by further extracting the essential data from LIMPS, our team is building a data warehouse through which the final product, the API and SDK, will be made publicly available for our global brain research community. So to summarize, um, based on close collaboration among in, uh, research engineering and technology teams, the cortical activity map project tries to address the question of how the sensory information is represented in the mouse brain. We will gain insight into how stimulus, behavior, and state are uh, represented by neural activities in mouse cortex in both single and populations of cells. And with that, I would like to thank all our CAM contributors and special thanks to people who helped us prepare this presentation. We'd like to thank all our Allen Institute colleagues and many thanks to our uh, founders, Paul Allen and Jody Allen, for their vision, encouragement, and support. And thank you all for your attention. All right, we have time for a few questions. Uh, I was wondering, um, beyond your plans of um, sharing or releasing the data sets, what are your plans for releasing the additional software that you've developed for either um, an analyzing the images or for behavior monitoring and those types of things? Yeah, so our target date is uh, the summer of next year. Did you want to say what kind of data to? Uh, can I elaborate some? So can you elaborate some uh, difficulties uh, between uh, registration the tissue site uh, slice to the common kind of framework? Because after uh, implantation of cranial window, usually the brain is distorted substantially. So that the shape of the brain usually is not in a perfect normal shape. Uh, so how how can you register that part? So are, are you? I'm sorry, so are you asking how to map the uh, ISI to the uh, brain tissue side? No, the last, the, the, the three last D brain context to most common content framework. Uh, yeah, because the uh, 3D brain uh, tissue side, um, the, the, the 3D tissue side brain is a, is a, is a 3D brain, and <laughs> the, um, the common coordinate framework is also the uh, 3D brain. So this is a pretty typical uh, question in computer vision, how to map two 3D um, volumes to each other. And 
we have ways to, um, which is based on intensity um, based iterative registration to do that. So we're also using the, the surface vasculature, the, the fiducials of the surface vasculature. Some of those are visualizable through the volume of the tissue site data as well. So that's a, I think that's part of the, the actual fiducials that are being used as surface vasculature in addition to the volumetric model. Um, I have a question about the written topic mapping and, and um, coordination of that with the anatomy. Uh, in humans, we can, we can predict quite well, quite accurately, um, in early visual cortex, written topic sensitivity based on cortical folding. And the question is whether there are any anatomic features that we can use here to predict written topic uh, sensitivity and also boundaries between written topic areas. Um, you mean in terms of like a vasculature landmark or something yeah, that, like that? Yeah, that would be... Um, nothing that's precise enough and consistent enough to actually target these areas. I mean, they're very small, like 500 microns or less. Um, and any biological variability in vasculature patterns is much more than that. So, I mean, you could use stereotypes at coordinates relative to the reference frame of the brain. But, again, the, the variability, there's slight variability in position of each area from animal to animal. And, and since they're so small... It's, it's really hard to target with anything other than using functional imaging. Uh, yeah, so given that, that the, the gain of the visual response will change with, with activity, um, how do you ensure that the mouse is doing the exact same thing behaviorally as you're giving them? Um, so there... Well, in the two, there's two different tracks. There's animals that are behaviorally trained, um, who are they, part of their behavioral training is to run, to learn to run on the disc. Um, so they're in a you know pretty stable state. And we monitor that running. Maybe not all animals will will be doing it properly, but we can at least track their running behavior and use that to correlate with the activity. Um, animals that are just getting this um, passive viewing of visual stimuli are habituated, uh, but they're not required to run or not. So. Again, we're monitoring that, uh, and we can compare that to the activity, but there's, it's, they can choose what to do, basically, on the wheel. Does that answer your question? Well, in, in uh, response to the last questions, you're also monitoring the pupil diameter, which is going to help <laughs> determine their state, yes. I believe, to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I mean, this is beautiful, and... Um, it's wonderful how all this has come together, but you know, in the end, you want to make sure you've done everything that you need to do. If somebody says, "Well, you should have done this," and then you say, "Oh no," you know. And one of the things I worry about is the temperature of the brain, mm -hmm. because I wonder with the head mount and the cranial window that that's kind of a big heat sink on a small mouse's yeah. head, and I'm wondering what the temperature of this of this visual cortex is. And you know, someday down the road, somebody say, "Well, five degrees is make a big difference." and yeah, no, that's imp very important to think about. Um, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I, I appreciate that you make that comment because it's something we have thought about and maybe something that we want to actually look at in more depth. It'd be easy just to measure and see if it's a problem. I don't yeah. know. Okay, are there any more questions? If not, then I'd like to thank everybody for their attention and in particular the speakers from this morning. Thank you.